you very much. I never realized that uh, we had a dinner conversation over wine, get quoted next day. <laughs> <laughs> but that, uh, that quote about how the life philosophy was actually a quote that uh, Dr. Bill Feggy shared with me, so I should attribute that quote to him. Uh, anyway, I hope you're all enjoying your lunch. Uh, I have been denied my lunch. I've been told that I have to first speak and then earn my lunch after the speech. So, so I'm going to try and do my best. So what I'll do is uh, maybe uh, in the interest of time, I'll give my talk first and then take questions and answers. Uh, it's a real pleasure being here. Thank you, Swati. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, all my friends at Duke. It's my first visit to Duke, and uh, it's been very, very enjoyable. And uh, thank you very much. So, uh, it uh, happens to be the uh, the World Diabetes Day, and uh, so, so just to reflect, uh, what this shows you. These are data from the latest Global Burden Study, uh, Global Burden of Disease Study, uh, done by University of Washington with. Uh, several collaborators worldwide. And what this is showing you is a ranking of uh, diseases in terms of uh, mortality worldwide. And two important points to make before we get into diabetes. First, that worldwide, except for a few countries, uh, life expectancy is improving everywhere. Uh, the United States gained 35 years in life expectancy over 100 years. And countries like India are achieving that same gain, India, China, in half or one third of the time. So the world is, people are living longer. Mortality patterns are, have declined. So that's a, a huge tribute to what we've achieved in the last 100 years. So yes, we're now faced with chronic diseases, but let's not forget that mechanization, improvement in economy has aided improvement in life expectancy. And what you see here in 1990, uh, the leading cause of death happened to be communicable diseases and undernutrition and disease like diabetes was something like number 15. Uh, but look at now in, in 2010, uh, you're seeing uh, the leading cause of death are clearly now non-communicable diseases. And diabetes has sprung up to number nine. So it's kind of so the chronic diseases are becoming very important in terms of uh, mortality worldwide. And this is true. I mean, I, there are data even in rural Bangladesh now, the leading cause of death is non-communicable disease. I mean, that's something to remember. So non-communicable diseases are no longer diseases of affluent or high-income countries. They are diseases everywhere, including rural parts of the world. So that's the first point here. The second, when you look in terms of risk factors for, uh, you know, the, here in this case, that contribute to disability-adjusted life years, that's a combination of uh, life years lost and disability. What you're seeing there, the leading risk factors, all of them, seem to be cardiometabolic risk factors. Uh, it's blood pressure, tobacco, you know, uh, inappropriate use of alcohol, uh, household air pollution, and also high body mass index, high fasting glucose. So very clearly, and uh, there's been another uh, WHO report which basically shows that the top six out of the top, ten, the top 10 factors in terms of global mortality are similar, whether it's a high-income country, low-income country, or a middle-income country. The order might vary, and out of those 10 factors, six or seven are cardiometabolic risk factors. So again, something going on. So, and diabetes is also an extremely costly disease, and these are data for the United States. And what this shows you, uh, it shows you the contribution of different diseases to growth in Medicare spending in the United States publicly funded Medicare funding in the United States. And in the period 1997 to 2006, the, the single disease that contributed to the fastest increase in expenditure was diabetes mellitus in the United States. And that's beginning to happen in several parts of the world because people with diabetes live long. They have a lot of uh, prolific complications, consume a lot of healthcare resources. And in countries of uh, the low and middle income uh, in a variety, uh, the disease also occurs at younger ages. So there's loss, uh, loss of life early, loss of productivity. So there's a lot of indirect costs other than medical costs too. So it's a costly disease, both for the health sector and outside the health sector. And when you talk about countries like India, and you're having this conversation about uh, other sub-Saharan countries, where a high proportion of people are under the age of 30, for example, if they're going to develop diabetes early, their economies will suffer 
uh, not just because of the cost of the disease, but also because what is the impact on the labor on the labor market, the negative impact on the labor market. So when you reflect on diabetes, what I've come to realize, having studied diabetes for the past 20 odd years, is that it is, when you think about it, it is an ancient disease. It's not something new that has sprung up on us, but it's, it's an ancient disease that's meeting a 21st century lifestyle and thus its major proliferation. Uh, so the diabetes has been described in the, in the Greeks, the, in the Romans, the Arabs, the Indians have all described diabetes in ancient times. And I got this wonderful quote from a 6th century Indian Ayurvedic text. There are two forms of diabetes, and they call it Madhumeha. Madhumeha is sweet urine in Sanskrit. One associated with emaciation, dehydration, polyuria, and lassitude, and the other with stout built gluttony, obesity, and sleepiness. Remarkable <coughs> description of type 1 and type 2 diabetes that you consider. So 1500 years later, you know, the, the paradigm stays with us. I mean, we're still trying to solve the puzzle. But in terms of modern understanding of diabetes, we owe a lot to the Pima Indians of Arizona. You know, they are a Native American tribe in Arizona, and they were a pre-Columbian migration to the Americas, uh, believed to have arrived about 35,000 years ago, crossing the Bering Land Bridge. They probably arrived somewhere from Central Asia, where the origins were, depending on physical, you know, using physical anthropology. And uh, they came to the Americas. Some of them went towards uh, South America, and a group came back, settled in the, in the banks of the Kira River. And uh, people like Jocelyn have visited the reservation and noted that in the early part of the last century, there wasn't much diabetes there. But suddenly, there was a sudden explosion of type 2 diabetes in the second half of the last century. <coughs> a lot of it had to do with a sudden change in lifestyle that came about after the building of the Roosevelt Dam, the Hill River dries up, uh, their agricultural civilization changes, they start getting dependent on, on local products, etc. <coughs> and that changed their lifestyle. And what is special is that almost all the diabetes in the population, in fact, all the diabetes in the population is type 2. They don't have type 1 in the population. And also, type 2 diabetes was reported as young as age 7. And at that time, young onset type 2 diabetes was thought to be a FEMA phenomenon until it was described in other Native American tribes. And now today, it is described virtually in every population of the world. Young onset type 2 diabetes, it's in whites and blacks, and Japanese, you name it, it's, it's everywhere. And uh, what was striking in the 1960s was that uh, Peter Bennett, you know, when he first did the survey in the Pima Indians, they found uh, by age 45, uh, the diabetes prevalence was 50% in the Pima Indians. And if you think that is high, I'm not showing you those data, we have recent data from the city of Chennai in, in India, where by age 50, uh, they are about as high as the Pima Indians. And after the age of 50, in fact, prevalence was even higher. So something's happening in these countries. And, uh, and I think some parts of uh, the Middle East, for example, where the, where the prevalence is very high, uh, they are becoming, you know, in fact, much higher than the Pima Indians were at one time. And what we, little did we realize that what was happening in the Pima Indians was anticipating what was going to happen to the rest of the United States. I mean, these are our data from the CDC showing you that diabetes is not a rare disease. The lifetime chance of a, of a child born in 2000 in the United States developing diabetes is one in three. And if you're a black child or a Hispanic child, your chance is one in two uh, of developing diabetes. And so when these data were released, uh, it, it was just shocking. You know, like I still remember presenting these data in 2002 at the American Diabetes Association. And for the next two days, we were hogged by the media. You know, the starting from CNN, it was, it was dramatic but it's, it's no longer considered shocking because it's now become reality. And this was a systematic review done by, uh, you know, good arts and, uh, uh, you know, using all the data that were available worldwide. And what this shows is a change in mean BMI uh, in a, in a, in a, per decade uh, across 199 countries. And what you're seeing there, in the majority of countries, mean BMI has been going up. Okay? And you also notice that when you plot change in mean glucose in the same 199 countries, and this is women, you find the same kind of pattern for men. Mean glucose levels are going up. 
But that's not the case when you look at, say, changes in mean blood pressure levels. Actually, mean blood pressure levels have declined overall. And if there is an increase in mean blood pressure levels, it happens to be in low and middle income countries. It's the same for mean cholesterol levels. Whereas when it comes to mean BMI and mean glucose, these are happening in all countries, almost all countries of the world, with some exceptions. So it's, a, it's much more of a global phenomenon uh, and, uh, you know, that, that's going on, that, uh, which actually that makes the agenda for diabetes and obesity research much more in common across the world as India. <coughs> So I want to, uh, today is World Diabetes Day, so these data that I'm now going to share with you are, were embargoed until a few hours ago. Uh, the IDF, the International Diabetes Federation, has released its latest atlas the data today. A committee of us work every year to updating the data, so I'm going to share with you. So you're probably the first ones in the world to hear these data. So the latest diabetes numbers as of today, uh, uh, we estimate there are 382 million people with diabetes worldwide. And this is projected to go up to 592 million uh, by 2035. So, <coughs> increase in diabetes. So, 382 million is more than the population of the United States. Our population is about 310 million people. So, so the country, there are two countries. United States plus Britain is the size of the diabetic population worldwide. <coughs> and it's affecting every region of the world, including sub-Saharan Africa, where there are data suggesting that diabetes is doubling in sub-Saharan Africa too. So it's no longer region specific. Asia has the largest number of cases because it has the largest population. So it's a, and the other thing, you think of the top countries in terms of numbers of people with diabetes, uh, they are China, India, United States, the three most populous countries in the world. And between them, <coughs> half, they share half the burden of diabetes worldwide. <coughs> but if you look at prevalence, which is the proportion of people with <coughs> population with diabetes, it's not these countries. They happen to be uh, the Middle Eastern countries, largely the oil rich Middle Eastern countries, and even the, uh, the Mediterranean Middle Eastern countries also, and some of the, uh, the, the Native American tribes, etc. And uh, in terms of healthcare expenditure, you'd be shocked to know that 45% of global healthcare expenditure uh, actually happens from the United States. The U.S. not only invests, you know, spends, you know, spends 45 percent of the world's defense, it also spends 45 percent of the world's healthcare expenditure. So there is that mismatch there. And yet, our uh, the U.S. health record, so the paper that we published in JAMA a few months ago, a few months ago, showing that despite that expense uh, in terms of health status, U.S. is among the lowest when it comes to high-income countries. So that's a paradox. <coughs> uh, and uh, Diabetes is no longer a, a disease of just poor people, of rich people. Even in low and middle income countries, you're beginning to see uh, the prevalence going up in upper middle income groups and low middle income groups, and increasingly even in low, low income groups in, in developing countries. So, so if, you, if you think it's a disease of affluence, forget about it, it's not. It's affecting, if anything, it's beginning to affect some of the low income groups very, very rapidly. And we assembled data uh, of good population-based studies in rural parts of low and middle income countries and was used the best data that were available. And what you're seeing here in rural parts of low and middle income countries, diabetes prevalence has gone up from 1.8% in 1985 89 to something like 8.6% in the previous 2005 2010. And the change, I mean, in countries like India, particularly in southern India, the convergence of rural and, di and, uh, and urban diabetes is happening very rapidly. And so again, uh, the processes are, I think, thinking of rural versus urban, uh, I, I think the time for that is limited. You know, I think uh, you know, things are changing too rapidly. And these are the data that were published by the World Economic Forum. And what this is showing you is on the x-axis, the likelihood of something happening, and the y-axis, the potential severity of that happening. And what you see there is uh, again uh, global non-communicable diseases their potential impact on global health uh, economic development is greater than the Chinese uh, uh, China slowing down or greater than the fiscal crisis which we had a few years ago so the, the impact of non-communicable disease or the threat of non-communicable disease on global economic development is huge so this is where NCDs like diabetes and the global development agenda start converging. So if you want 
healthy global development, we have to con control non-communicable diseases. And it's also a vicious cycle in terms of one of the biggest contributors increasingly to poverty is becoming non-communicable diseases. So, so again, I think we need to forget about the, the, the old agenda versus new agenda. The, the, you know, they're not silos anymore. They actually start you know, uh, converging. And it's also true about infectious diseases. The, the, the most vulnerable populations for infectious diseases are people with chronic diseases, in particular. So we have to think more pluralistically when we, when we think of uh, agendas here. This, these are, again, the latest data from the International Diabetes Federation. And what this is showing you is development is actually good in one sense. Because, yes, development is causing the diabetes epidemic in some sense. But when you think in terms of uh, the impact of uh, GDP on outcomes among people with diabetes in terms of mortality, the countries with good econ economies have better outcomes. And the one exception there is Saudi Arabia, which is that big red dot in the middle. It's a high income country, but still has a, uh, you know, has, has you know, high mortality from people from diabetes. And why that is the case, we need to understand. But the point of the slide is, in the United States, mortality among people with diabetes is going down, and that's also true in many high income countries. But the numbers of people with diabetes keeps increasing. So you will still have more people with end-stage renal disease, more people with amputations, although the rates may be going down, simply because the numbers are going up. So we have to do something to prevent the disease. So that's where uh, we need to look into uh, evidence for prevention. And there's very strong evidence, which has emerged in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, I want to read out this quote for you. The physician to, should take pride in the prevention of diabetes in his practice, the physician should consider it as important to prevent his patients from acquiring diabetes as he feels it incumbent upon himself to vaccinate them against smallpox or typhoid fever or to protect them from exposure to tuberculosis. Anybody <coughs> guess who said this and when? Jocelyn, is it? Also, also, anybody else? And when do you think this was said? It was uh, Jocelyn, Elliot Jocelyn, of Jocelyn Clinic, Boston, in 1921. And 1921 was also what happened? What, what other major thing happened in 1921? Banting and Bast. Best and Bast. Insulin was discovered. So here there was excitement worldwide about a potential treatment for diabetes. And there was this visionary Jocelyn talking about the importance of preventing the disease. So I think. And it was almost 70 years later, there's been a slew of uh, diabetes prevention trials. I was fortunate to uh, spend my time in uh, the NIDDK in, Pima, in the Pima Indian study, when Bill Lawler was designing a, a trial which ended up becoming the diabetes prevention program, the largest diabetes prevention study. And since then, there have been numerous studies of lifestyle intervention and drugs, all showing promising reductions in the DPP showed a 58% reduction uh, in the incidence of diabetes from lifestyle intervention among people with IGT. Think of a drug that reduces the incidence of a disease by 60%. It'll be a blockbuster. You know, so I think, you know, so that's <coughs> let's go through some of these trials. This is uh, data from the Diabetes Prevention Program trial. Uh, huge reduction in the incidence of diabetes, lifestyle intervention versus placebo. And the lifestyle intervention in the study was 150 minutes of physical activity per week, and if you're overweight, lose up to 7% of your body weight through healthy diet and physical activity. So, so I think the drug company must have heard that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the DPP was a remarkable study uh, 27 centers across the United States. It took two years of planning the protocol, two years to recruit the people. We screened about 160,000 people were, you know, uh, nationally, and 3,000 people were randomized. And the study, in this study, the DSMB, the Data Safety Monitoring Board, uh, did both of its functions. Number one, it stopped the troglutazone arm at 14 months of follow-up because of adverse uh, liver side effects. And two years later, it stopped this trial because the lifestyle intervention had more than achieved its benefits. So very, very you know, ironic, but extremely interesting. And it worked across all age groups. In fact, the biggest reduction in diabetes uh, incidence was in age group 60 and over from lifestyle intervention. 
It worked across all ethnic groups. And we also looked at it by different economic groups, different education groups. It was very consistent. So, you know, so it's very strong evidence. And uh, this, these are data for the Finnish diabetes prevention study. Oh, people say, but you can't maintain lifestyle intervention. But they have shown 13, 10 years now. They've recently analyzed 13 years of follow-up showing that the group that participated in the lifestyle intervention at 13 years has still you know, benefits. You know, in fact, the benefits keep widening over time. There was a study in China, the Chinese uh, Da Ching study, which published 20 years of data. <coughs> at 20 years, there still is a difference between the lifestyle group and the, uh, the non-lifestyle group, the placebo group. So, in, so, so it's, a, it's very strong evidence of the impact of lifestyle interventions, physical activity, and improvements in diet on diabetes incidence sustained over 20 years. And yes, that's the good news, but the bad news is over 20 years, still a high proportion of people, even in the treatment group, go on to develop diabetes. So we haven't come anywhere close to eradicating it, but we can definitely reduce the incidence by about half. Or people always ask me, what about genes? Genes are, you know, yes. I mean, so far when you look at the, uh, the uh, single nucleotide poly polymorphisms, some 80 odd of them are associated with diabetes, reported in several populations. But I'd like to make three broad points about genes, and I'm simplifying the genetic data here. First, these are data from the Framingham Offspring Study, where they compared two risk <coughs> prediction models. One which had simple things like age, gender, family history, BMI, uh, blood pressure in one blood draw, or HDL, fasting glucose, and triglycerides. Just one blood, you know, something that you would do quickly. The second, they added at that time data on 18 genotypes. And this is telling you that in terms of prediction, the addition of the genotypes makes no difference. And I think that's very similar for cardiovascular disease. Or, uh, you know, so, the, so whenever there's a new uh, gene association reported, companies jump in to say, you know, let, you know there's a million the test to do. But we need to be cautious about it. Genes help us understand the pathophysiology of diseases. But in terms of the clinical application immediately, they seem to be limited except for certain conditions. You know, so we need to be cautious about that. The second thing, this is very, very interesting. This is a study which compared European Americans, African Americans, Latinos, Japanese Americans, and native uh, Hawaiians. And essentially, the type 2 uh, diabetes risk alleles were pretty consistent across ethnic groups. So we make a lot about Different genetic differences across ethnic groups and across race groups, you know, it's very small in the, in the overall picture or non existent. The other very, very positive finding from trials like the DPP in the DPP, they save DNA, so every time a new gene is uncovered, go back and test the gene and see what sort of gene environment interaction there is. And look at this here this TCF7L2, uh, a major gene for diabetes affects beta cell function. In the placebo group, people with, this, uh, with, 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 those, with the genotype had it, were at high risk. But look at the lifestyle intervention group. Uh, the lifestyle eliminates the excess risk conferred by genes. And this has been shown for several other genes in the DPP and in the Finnish diabetes prevention study. So having a gene for diabetes or genes for diabetes is not a sentence that you have to develop. It is, it is a gene environment interaction, particularly in the kind of environment we live in today. Uh, it has impact, lifestyle intervention has impact on other things, like here showing you, the DPP, that people at baseline who did not have the metabolic syndrome, when you compared uh, the progression the, in the lifestyle intervention group, progression of metabolic syndrome was much lower. The DPP has also shown impact on uh, uh, the reduction of urinary incontinence in women, improvement in liver function from lifestyle intervention, improvement in disability, uh, improvements in knee function, etc. cetera, multiple. So it's a, it's, there are multiple outcomes in terms of uh, uh, lifestyle intervention uh, on, on health status and also on quality of life. Uh, in the last few months, there was this trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, called uh, the, uh, the Mediterranean uh, uh, Diet. The Mediterranean Diet really uh, is a diet that largely used, well, used to be used in the Mediterranean region essentially a diet that is high in polysaturated, uh, you know, monounsaturated fat, a diet that is high in fiber, a diet which is rich in complex fiber, carbohydrates, you know, the kind of diet. So what the study showed was when they compared three groups. The control group was actually a low-fat diet group. 
they were, they were not compliant, but it was a low fat diet group. And the other two Mediterranean groups, one was rich in nuts, the other was rich in extra virgin olive oil, but showing you for the first time from a dietary intervention a reduction in cardiovascular disease incidence. So basically, again, supporting the idea that a holistic diet, which is high in, uh, monosa in a monosaturated, in good fats, in good carbohydrates, in the right amount of proteins, and uh, high fruits and vegetables, fiber, etc., has huge impacts on, uh, on cardiovascular disease. None of the three groups lost weight. So while we focus on heavily on obesity, there is a distinction between uh, being overweight and, uh, and, and the need to lose weight to, uh, to control. Uh, so I don't know. I think this is a complex area. Is it, is it all driven by weight, or is it, are there other things involved? So when we analyzed, you know, a colleague of mine and me, we looked at all the diabetes prevention programs. Essentially, uh, what you need for diabetes prevention is a multi <coughs> approach. Yes, if you're consuming a lot of calories, a reduction in calorie intake, a reduction in fat intake, uh, increase in fiber, and I'd also add to this improving the quality of carbohydrates and the quality of fat based on the Mediterranean diet, uh, increase in leisure time physical activity, weight reduction plus or minus. I mean, there are some trials like the India DPP and the, Ch and the Chinese Daqing study. There was no weight loss, but there was improvement in dietary in, uh, in, uh, in lifestyle and in, in diabetes incidence. Uh, behavior change counseling. But what is very important is almost all of these trials uh, particularly the DPP, used a very, very well-designed de lifestyle intervention program. It wasn't as simple as telling people to lose weight or to change their behavior. This was 16 weekly sessions followed by eight weekly maintenance sessions. It was almost like physical therapy or psychological therapy, where you brought in the best of behavioral medicine, the best of uh, you know, physical activity medicine. So it's a, it's a large undertaking you're talking about. And most uh, health uh, systems in, in the US don't have the capacity to deliver this kind of lifestyle intervention. I think that's a gap. Uh, you know, how do we how do we meet that gap? It's something we should discuss. Uh, but also, as we said, the strong evidence for preventing the major complications. <coughs> and again, in the interest of time, I'm going to be sh brief here. You can review the literature together, whether it's glycemic control. Okay, there are questions about whether lowering below 6.5 is beneficial or not. But overall. You know, glycemic control is beneficial, uh, blood pressure control is beneficial, lipid management in people with diabetes is beneficial, use, use of aspirin is, uh, regular eye exams, regular foot exams, flu shots, diabetes education, all of them have huge benefits in terms of improving, uh, reducing complications and improving quality of life. And uh, there was this very nice trial, a small trial done in Denmark, a country with universal health care, so there's access available to everybody. So they took 80, 160 patients with diabetes and microalbuminuria. It was a small study, so they wanted high risk of progression to cardiovascular disease. And in one group, they let them have standard care, which was in a universal health care setting in a rich country. They were being managed the way they were. And the other 80 patients, they put in a structure where blood pressure, A1C, lipids, uh, you know, your, your angiotensin, ACE inhibitor use, aspirin use are all structured. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, it was well organized care. What was striking was even in Denmark, where they're all against the background of universal health care and good care, they were still able to reduce complications of diabetes by 50 to 60 percent, including death. So the, this tells you that in spite of good evidence, there is a huge gap in its implementation. And that's very true even of countries like the United States. You just need to look at the proportion of people with diabetes in the U.S. Uh, meeting goals for blood pressure lipids and A1C, less than half. And what proportion meet all three? Less than 10%. So there's a huge gap in our implementation. So what can we do to narrow the gap in implementation is a big question. And this is, again, you would be surprised. You can do a review of this literature in Bangladesh. You'll probably find uh, similar kinds of gaps in implementation. So it's not just about the amount of money that is available. It is how that money is used and organized. So a lot of chronic disease care is about organization. So this is uh, Frank Lippur, uh, you know, used to be my, uh, my boss at uh, CDC. Great slide. On the one hand, there's huge knowledge. On the other hand, there's huge need. And how do you build the bridge is a, is a big question for implementation, particularly for low and middle income countries. And this is where we need to think in terms of access to care. And 
We're talking a lot about Obamacare these days. So I looked at some data, and what this is showing you in the US, uh, comparing people who have insurance from people who do not have insurance, uh, when it comes to receiving preventive care services, clearly people who are insured, higher probability of receiving preventive care services. And when it comes to uh, control of uh, diabetes control or blood pressure control, a big difference between those who are insured and those who are not insured. So telling you, from insuring access is, is the basic minimum that you need. And beyond that, there are other things you have to do. And in fact, these are data from our Medicare population you know, data, for example. In the US, and you compare people who are not insured uh, with people who are insured. Till the age of 65, look at their health status as measured by self-reported hypertension, heart disease, stroke, diabetes. Huge difference between those who are insured and those who are not insured. But after the age of 65, once Medicare kicks in and insurance becomes available, that, that gap narrows. So again, arguing that the availability of health care through insurance actually narrows the gap between the uninsured and the, un and the insured. And there are also data suggesting that after the age of 65, people who had not been insured actually end up consuming a lot more resources from the healthcare system. So it's very wise to spend some money up front to save a lot of money down, downstream. So I think it makes a lot of logical argument there. And this is a huge problem when you talk of low and middle income countries. I mean, like in many of the low and middle income countries, uh, 30, 40, 50 percent of the uh, payment is out of pocket. So this is going to be a huge area if you're going to talk about care for diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancers. How do we ensure uh, low-cost insurance against catastrophic illness? How do you come up with low-cost insurance for preventive health care? This is going to be a huge industry, and it's beginning to happen in some countries. So again, something to think about. How do you improve access? And when you think in terms of uh, what kind of things improve diabetes care for people with diabetes, again, not no one thing, but things like team changes, care management, patient reminders, patient education, having some electronic patient registry to follow up people, clinician education, uh, self-management, audit and feedback loops, etc. But all of these are organizational interventions. They're not pharmacological interventions, they're organizational interventions. So essentially, good care, improvement of quality really is about uh, multi-faceted strategies to, to track people, stratify them uh, in terms of the risk, having structures in place, measurements in place, etc. So audit, performance, and aligning payment systems. I mean, doctors get paid for volume. The more, you, more time you see a people, the more tests you pay, you, you, you do. Maybe they should be paid for quality. You know, that's something that is an important thing to consider. And, this, and these experiments were done in some places like the VA, for example. So potentially, that's one area that we can work on. And what are the broader policy implications of all this? Firstly, just based on the evidence we have, 50% of diabetes can be prevented, especially in people at high risk, those with pre-diabetes. Which, just to give you an idea, in the US, there are about 80 million people with pre-diabetes. So it's a huge population. It's one third of the population, if you like. And 50% of diabetes complications can be prevented just by applying what we know or blood pressure control, glucose control, lipid control, etc. But we're not doing it. But the challenge, therefore, is in the implementation of this. So, you know, we wrote this policy piece for health affairs some you know, last year for our symposium. 30 to 80 percent of adults with diabetes worldwide remain undiagnosed. In the U.S. it's about 30 percent. If you go to Sierra Leone, it's about 80 percent. And but 90 percent of people with pre-diabetes, even in the U.S., are unaware that they have it or even if they get tested, nothing happens. So we need systematic and organized policies for early detection of pre-diabetes and diabetes. How we do it, it's a, it's, a, it's a national question. And then there are cost-effective interventions to prevent <coughs> diabetes and its complications. The question is, how do you implement it? And there are some ideas that I shared with you about how you might implement this. And then that's not enough. We need policies for financing, for infrastructure, and for regulation uh, to support delivery of proven lifestyle interventions uh, that are embedded within community resources. Like in the US, 70% of people live within three to five miles of the YMCA, for example. So one of the things that's going on in several states, in five or six states, is that CDC and ADA have worked together 
to certify a program or, a, or, or, or lifestyle intervention which is based on the DPP. So if that program is offered at the YMCA uh, you know, by people who have been trained, then United Health Group would reimburse the cost of lifestyle intervention. So we need more imaginative implementation of lifestyle interventions along those lines. And we need follow-up and delivery of other proven interventions within clinics. Uh, we need frameworks and institutions for ensuring quality of care. I mean, in the US, there is the Alliance uh, you know, the, uh, Coalition, which at least measures quality of care and their incentives. In several parts of the world, quality of care institutions don't exist. So they, they, those institutions need to arise, not to regulate doctors, but you require some sort of quality assurance to, to ensure the care, appropriate care is delivered and inappropriate care is not delivered. So you need those systems. And lastly, workforce development becomes very, very important. I mean, it's unlikely that most of the low and middle income countries will ever have the, the numbers of uh, physicians needed to deliver chronic disease care. And plus, it's too expensive, so we have to resort to things like care coordinators, lifestyle coaches, use of technology like cell phone internet. So innovative, low-cost models of training non-physician healthcare workers. I mean, to manage your blood pressure, why would you always need to go to a physician? You know, so those are the kind of things that need to emerge. Uh, and, and finally, at a much broader level, you're going to need global partnerships in research. What's shocking is, 90% of the global burden is in low and middle income countries, but 90% of global research happens to be in high income countries. And there is a mismatch there. And there's also a lot of opportunity. I mean, there are huge scientific gaps that can be filled with better partnerships and research in low and middle income countries. And we may have to learn from industry how do you leverage global collaboration. On the one hand, we complain about food companies and beverage companies spreading their market. But maybe we should learn from them as to how to spread health education more effectively, how to collaborate more effectively. Maybe there's a lesson to learn from them. And we need global health-friendly policies in trade, in food, uh, in food and agriculture, etc. Tobacco. Uh, it should be speaking about tobacco. You can see it from here. But uh, think of tobacco. Where is tobacco sales happening most in low- and middle-income countries now? Because high-income countries are introducing regulations. Companies are moving to those markets. And food and agriculture, we make this clip uh, sort of recommendation, everybody should eat uh, five portions of fruits and vegetables a day. A PhD student of mine is looking at global supply. There isn't uh, the global supply even in the United States. In fact, in some countries, there's a gap of five times. You know, so how do we reform agriculture to improve production of fruits and vegetables? So that's an important question. How, what sort of urban planning do we need? I mean, humanity is not going to go back to the uh, you know, living in rural areas and, and hardship. People are going to live more and more in cities. How do we design the cities that are healthy? I think that should be the kind of uh, approach we need to take public transportation, maybe. But where does the money come from? So these are some of the important issues we have to address. Uh, this is a paper that was published in Nature about the major challenges, just to highlight them. We have to raise public awareness around diseases like diabetes and chronic diseases. We have to address the economic, legal, and environmental policies in a way that it does not hurt development, but at the same time enhances health. We have to modify the risk factors like we've spoken about. We have to engage the business community in some sort of uh, collaborations, most of the business communities. Uh, mitigate the health impacts of poverty and urbanization, very, very important. Uh, and reorient the health systems towards uh, chronic disease care. Uh, just to finish off, I just want to share with you our experience uh, in the Emory is one of the centers for excellence uh, in Sos Duke, uh, in, they're funded by the NHLBI. So we have this center called CARS, which brings together collaborators from New Delhi, Chennai, Karachi, and also our partners at CDC. So it's a, it's a global collaboration. And we've been, we spent the last five or six years building some <coughs> long-term projects. Uh, we're tracking 28,000 people in, Chen in, uh, in three cities. These are representative samples of the cities, so it's like a surveillance system. These are, we've done a survey and we're tracking them every year for uh, chronic diseases, so it becomes a research infrastructure. Second, in Chennai, we are running a diabetes prevention trial, which is just finished. We should be publishing our results next year, uh, you know, showing positive results, actually. And we are running a trial in 10 sites across India and Pakistan, uh, basically implementing quality of care improvement strategies. And our hypothesis is through organized care, you can actually reduce cardiovascular risk 
tremendously. Uh, and we take taking advantage of the high numbers of type 2 diabetes, young ones with type 2 diabetes, and we are doing studies in that population and many other studies. And in the process, we've also built strong research coordination facilities in Chennai and Delhi, uh, which allows us any time we can now launch a multi-center study in, in the region with the kind of same quality of research as you would find here. So that's something that we've achieved. And we've also spent a lot of time in uh, training and building capacity. We have a two-way interactive philosophy. On the one hand, we train doctoral and postdoctoral fellows from India. They either come to Emory or get trained there or both. So we've had several of them funded by several mechanisms. But we also have a parallel uh, process for training doctoral and US, uh, and postdoctoral US fellows in India-focused or subcontinent-focused research, and again, Many of them end up spending one to two years in those regions getting their PhD, <coughs> et cetera. And we're trying to allow this to become into a network of young investigators. And so this is a very powerful, I think, a change in, you know, when, you, when you do something like this. So, and there is, just to show you one example before I finish my talk, there are scientific opportunities here. I mean, showing you here are data of, diabe of uh, uh, diabetes prevalence in US uh, immigrants, as people in the US who are born overseas in, in another country. And there are about 36 million people in the US who are born in another country. And 36 million, that's about 14% of the population. Legally, if you add the undocumented, it's probably higher than that. Rena Oza Frank, who did her PhD with me, and now, now works in Ohio, did this for her thesis. What you see there, look at the diabetes prevalence in normal weight, overweight and obese groups in the European immigrants. These are European immigrants in yellow and the Indian subcontinent immigrants uh, in blue and white. Uh, the normal weight, quote unquote, Indian immigrant has a higher prevalence of diabetes than the obese European immigrant. So it's telling you there's a huge disconnect between obesity and, and diabetes, and the highest prevalence of uh, diabetes is in people of the Indian subcontinent in the United States. So, so I've had uh, several PhD students doing their research in some of these areas, and just to show you one which was published in Diabetes Care earlier this year, Lisa Steinmeis looked at two things. She said, you know, uh, let's look at the, the relative contributions of insulin resistance and beta cell function uh, in, a, in, 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 in this population. So she measured beta cell function by a measure called uh, oral disposition index. It's basically uh, the change in glucose and change in insulin from 0 to 30 minutes. It's, a, it's been validated against clams. And she measured uh, insulin resistance based on HOMA IR. And she looked at several standard <coughs> groups people with normal glucose, people with isolated fasting glucose, high fasting glucose, people with isolated IGT or prediabetes, people who had both high fasting glucose and high 2 hour glucose, and people who are diabetic. The red line is the change in HOMA IR. I mean, what's what we all know. As, in, as the stage of diabetes progresses, insulin resistance goes up. But the blue bars are the drop in beta cell function. From NGT, from normal to impaired fasting glucose or impaired fasting, you know, glucose tolerance, there's a huge drop in, uh, in beta cell function. So the drop in beta cell function is happening quite early, and we've replicated this in two other South Asian studies. One, the Masala cohort, which is a cohort of Indian Americans in California and Chicago, and another one in youth onset type 2 diabetes in India. And so perhaps in populations like Indians, Japanese, etc., the bigger problem might be an early decline in beta cell function. And um, so the original paradigm has always been, this was uh, started from the Pima Indians, but the development of diabetes was a two-step process where because of obesity, changes in lifestyle, the primary problem was insulin resistance. And then as insulin resistance progressed, the beta cell was unable to com compensate. And there was secondary beta cell function. That is completely true. But there might also be another alternative, an, an additional explanation. And that is where genes help us. When you plot the genes for diabetes, the known genes for di type 2 diabetes, and the known genes for obesity, there's not a lot of overlap. The only overlap there is is in these four, these four, uh, in these four genes, the FTO and three other smaller genes. So there is, you know, two, uh, the two diseases are, ha are happening par in parallel, but the genes don't entirely overlap, suggesting that there might be other mechanisms for diabetes that you need to search. And that may be where it might be beta cell function, it might be other things. And so uh, perhaps, you know, developed by Steve Kahn and others, 
perhaps yes, that's one mechanism for diabetes. Uh, uh, you know, the insulin, the insulin resistance is a huge uh, component. But maybe there's another component, which is there are people who are endowed with a normal beta cell and who can cope with the, with the demands. And there are people with a susceptible beta cell who can't cope with the demands. And maybe in populations that have grown through modern, you know, for, through several centuries of, uh, uh, you know, malnutrition, et cetera, maybe their beta cells are compromised too. Just like their muscle was compromised, maybe their beta cell is compromised too. So this, these are the kind of areas where there are huge opportunities to understand the etiology of research by engaging in, glo in, in global, re global health. Finally, when you look in terms of uh, what non-communicable disease globally, it's 60% of the burden, but about 2.3% of global investment <coughs> goes towards non-communicable disease. And this is where we can learn from HIV. We wrote this in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, at the time of the UN summit. So look what's happened with HIV AIDS. Till about 1996, funding, global funding was very low. And thanks to UN AIDS and then UN GAS, Global Fund, PEPFAR, funding starts going up. That's the line in black. And the line in red is the annual number of AIDS-related deaths. Some you know, indication that that's going down. And the annual number of HIV-infected cases also. So ecologically, there seems to be a connection between investment in research or in programs and some impact in terms of health outcomes. So perhaps this is where the NCD agenda needs to move, you know, if we have to control the disease. And I would argue that the idea that we have all the research for high-income countries, we can just go and implement them in low-income countries, I find that is too naive. We need more research also in low- and middle-income countries, particularly more surveillance, more uh, pathophysiological research, more implementation research, because we might be surprised. We might find differences. And, and also, having local data is the best way to change local policy sometimes. So I'll stop there. It's a huge agenda, global health, and I love this quote from Harry Truman. It is amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit because collaborations become huge. People are too worried about ownership and who gets credit, who gets right, etc. You have to let go on that and just you know, keep the goal on the big picture, make things happen. You'll get your credit and you'll get your share. But don't worry about it. Thank you very much.